Today's story was written by Reddit user Fox Corp. A cold, dark universe. That's all I've ever known. The ancient past of the universe's most ancient civilizations tells tales of all-encompassing light, gargantuan star-forged nebulas, bright blue supergiants, dim yellow dwarfs, and the comparatively long-lasting red dwarfs all existing at the same time. The universe was bright, young and full of light for any aliens that lived during those years to revel in. We, the Antari, had only ever known a red dwarf to actually exist, emerging some 50 trillion years after the universe's birth. I'm an astronomer. Just a day ago, this was a useless profession. There were only a couple things that could be seen, and all of them had already been seen by some geezer half a quadrillion years ago. My life would have been filled with looking at fields of nothing. Anywhere I looked, I would have seen black dwarfs and black holes. If I looked with a powerful enough telescope, I could have seen the small pockets of incredibly dim white dwarfs, the last vestiges of light in the local cluster the stars that tragically died some two billion years before my eyes could bask in their light. If those ancient scientists nearly two quadrillion years removed could have stopped the big rip a couple billion years sooner, I could have peered back to their time of light and beauty, but they couldn't figure it out until nothing but only the local galactic groups could be seen. And so, astronomers revered themselves to do nothing but scan hopelessly in search of the impossible until today. SG Silent Watcher Entry Log, Galactic Standard Year 2.041 Asterix 10-15, in orbit of Black Dwarf, 0 0.53 Solar Mass, 2 orbiting rocky planets, captured rogue planets, status, occupied, Chief Astronomer Gyrus Prattler, cause of log entry, unscheduled system entry by Error unknown, class vessel. End log. Unknown vessel, state your intentions. I waited at least a minute for a response. Unknown vessel, respond. Damn it, what the hell is that thing? I asked myself this question over and over as I peered over the sensory equipment. Whatever this thing was, it was massive. At least twice as massive as the captured rogue planet my station currently orbits. If it keeps moving towards the Black Dwarf at the centre of this system as it is now, it'll knock my station, and the planet it orbits, into an unknown future. In a dead universe, unknowns are foreign and dangerous. But perhaps it is the most interesting thing any astronomer has seen in untold thousands of millennia, so I wasn't about to complain. In a rare moment of genius, I decided that the vessel may not use galactic standard FTL communication systems. Its design was esoteric, so perhaps its communications were esoteric as well. If any species in my database didn't make this ship, perhaps it wasn't created by any of those species, but by someone far removed from the current reality of this universe. After spinning up that ancient laser communication system, I sent a simple message in Galactic Standard, alongside all necessary information, to translate the language, of course. After the five light minute gap between my station and the object was crossed, I noticed a change on the sensors. The vessel revealed its true form. A gargantuan sphere dotted with lights and bristles, presumably thrusters and communication spires. Hopefully not weapons. After another five light minutes passed, I received a message from this massive vessel. This is Admiral Cole of the HSF Remembrance. We come in peace. Please forward any relevant data to aid in communications to this vessel's communication suite. Coordinates are attached. I sat in my chair, awestruck for roughly a minute. A first contact situation in this day and age. In a universe this old, Finding something no one's ever heard of is, for lack of a better phrase, unheard of. But I had a job to do and set my astonishment aside for the moment. I am Chief Astronomer Prattler of the SG Silent Watcher. In the name of the Intari Republic, I welcome you to the Milkdromeda Galaxy. 
Attached with this message are the specifications and frequency I transmit on over standard FTL communications. Send a test message over channel 1000 once you have the transmitter up and running. I couldn't sit idly by while waiting for the response. I forwarded the message to High Command, describing my current situation, and within the minute I had a virtual conference of at least half the damn galaxy tuning into my audio feeds. After five and a half light minutes of anticipation, Channel 1000 was filled with noise. Testing, testing, SG Silent Watcher, can you hear me? I scrambled out of my chair and responded. Loud and clear, please tune to Channel 4569 for further communications with official government channels. There was silence on the other end from this point forward. I didn't have the authorization to tune to 4569, and so I, and by extension, the many trillions of beings now captivated by the fantastical sphere were left in the dark. To my great surprise, after roughly five minutes of silence, I got confidential instructions from the government to tune to 4569 anyway. Chief Astronomer Prattler, please prepare to be brought aboard the Remembrance. I was caught off guard. What exactly must I do? Close your eyes and have a bath bag at the ready. Your station is going to undergo a pinpoint FTL manoeuvre to bring you inside the HSF Remembrance momentarily. The sentence was absurd, but when a massive, artificially constructed sphere with the mass of a planet says to do something, you do it. I grabbed a paper bag from under my desk, closed my eyes, and tried not to move too much. What came next was even stranger than the idea of a station going into FTL. Chief Astronomer Prattler, welcome aboard the HSF Remembrance. I opened my eyes and noticed something incredibly strange. Where is the station? Exactly where it was. Exactly where you no longer are. And before you ask, I don't know how it works. Something, something, wormholes and superposition. To be honest with you, I'm no scientist. I was too stunned to respond as I looked around. There was a blue sky above me, illuminated by a bright yellow light. A star. I bathed in the glorious light and absorbed my surroundings. Of course it wasn't real, but for all intents and purposes, it felt real. How? Looking back, maybe it wasn't the best question. I could have asked about the inner workings of the spherical vessel, where exactly I was, and what I was doing there, or a plethora of other more pertinent questions. But the idea of standing in artificial sunlight, something I'd only ever seen in movies and documentaries, it was overwhelming. This is exactly what this system used to look like. The man in front of me fiddled with the device on his wrists. It began displaying a hologram of a yellow star and nine planets. The Sun, Mercury, Venus, my species cradle world, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and the incredibly distant planet Nine. This is how the solar system we currently reside in looked some 13.7 billion years after the universe was born. 13.7 billion? This man must be joking. 13.7 billion. You mean to tell me your species is that old? Yes, I do. We are humans, but your universe hasn't heard that name uttered for the better part of a quadrillion years. Humans never existed. They're a myth made up by the... I realised the absurdity of what I was saying mid-sentence. You're... you're a human, aren't you? Yes. The human in front of me chuckled slightly. I'm Admiral Cole, and I'm here to reclaim the soul system. Inquiry to the Collective Human Data Bank. Info on the HMS Remembrance. Inquirer, Chief Astronomer Prattler. Inquirer lacks necessary security clearance. Enter override code. 104-559 Admiral Cole. Code accepted. Now displaying. Information HSF Remembrance. Starforge class vessel. Purpose, to recycle matter into energy and turn it back into matter again, 
restart stellar life. Mass, one Earth mass. Population, 141,373,449,031. Housed on mini birch spheres, 50 layers. Gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared plus or minus one meter per second squared. Provided by Central Black Hole. Radius, 3,958.8 miles. Any more inquiries? Yes. While I was busy asking questions to the human database, the ship I now found myself on began to operate. Unbeknownst to me at the time, it was busy ripping apart the black dwarf at the center of this system, the Sol system. The stellar remnant that used to be the sun had nearly been entirely turned to energy by the time I was done with my second inquiry. And inside the ship, I hadn't felt a thing. Whatever methods the humans used to make the ship, it was better than any Intari-made vessel I'd ever heard of. I learned of this development when Admiral Cole decided to inform me that the blackened star I once studied and the station I once called home had been turned into pure energy. The artificial lights may flicker while the matter synthesis occurs. Don't worry, electricians are working on figuring that out. I stopped asking questions and turned my attention to the clear blue sky and vibrant yellow star I stood under. I noticed nothing until I felt a slight shudder and the sky disappeared, being replaced by a gargantuan metal sheath that lay above me. That must be what you mean by mini birch layers, huh? Yep, Admiral Cole replied. We're on layer 25 out of 50. What you're feeling is a ring segment we are currently standing on, pulling negative Gs. The central black hole has gained some mass, and the segment is compensating for your comfort. How long can it keep that up? Surely the segments can only move so much before they risk damaging each other. That's a question you should ask the engineers, but the answer is yes anyway. Normally, the gravity is allowed to get a bit more or less extreme depending on the needs of the ship. For a guest such as you, we will try to make things as comfortable as possible. After taking a moment to think, I decided it was time to ask the question burning a hole through my skull. When your computer said the goal was to restart stellar life, did that... My voice trailed off, but Admiral Cold replied with a single word that filled my heart with a hope I'd never felt before. Yes. When can I see it? Soon. Progress report on the project. Coming along nicely, we've already attained the full support of local aliens. What about the non-local aliens? We've fought them ever since we made first contact in the Trappers-1 system. This will be no different. Fair enough. But returning to the universal stage in this way, it's certainly an escalation. And we will deal with the consequences, from Earth, like we did two quadrillion years ago. I look forward to seeing all of you planetside once again. This council has much to discuss. Absolutely. It's time to take gloves off. Our enemies have stifled the development of the younger races for far too long. With direct human intervention, we can tip the scales. Prattler, it's done. As if I was in a trance, I followed the Admiral blindly through the bows of the ship, going from transporter to transporter, teleporter to teleporter, all to eventually end up in a massive viewing area, illuminated by nothing other than artificial light. I saw nothing, as per usual. I thought you said it was done. Admiral Cole waved his hand and pointed to an empty point in space. Watch. A beam of light emanated from the human ship, illuminating the point at which the Admiral's finger was pointing. Laying there in the lightless void was a cloud of gas. Hydrogen, helium, and trace amounts of heavier elements. We're going to kickstart the sun back as it was 13.7 billion years after the universe was born, just as it was when early man looked to the sky. The beam of light widened, illuminating four more ships of the same make surrounding the gas cloud. One ship on each pole, three around the middle. Then, inexplicably, a cloud of black began to emerge from the ships. Within minutes, the cloud had taken the form of a shell, closing in and around the gas cloud. I'd never seen one before, 
but this was the very early stage of a Dyson Sphere, a megastructure for a bygone era. Admiral Cole pushed a button on his wrist. Start ignition. I felt the ship shudder and a beam of incredibly intense light shot out from the ship, hitting an energy bank on the shifting surface of the Dyson Swarm. All at the same time, all the ships also fired a beam into the fray. The brightness forced me to shield my eyes while waiting for the glass before me to darken. For the next 30 minutes, I sat in a trance, watching intently as the Dyson Swarm closed in further and further increasing the pressure on the gas cloud until I eventually began to see the light coming from the Dyson Swarm directly. A star had been born. The beam shooting out of the ship ceased at once, and the swarm began to return to sender. The window was completely obfuscated by the drones for several minutes. What I saw afterward was the most beautiful sight I've ever had the pleasure of witnessing. A G-type star with a solar mass of 1, an absolute magnitude of 4.83 radius of 1 solar radii. Everything that it currently is, is exactly as it was. The universe saw light once more, the light of humanity. They've told me their light shall never go out, and I pray every night that they're right. Thank <laughs> you.